Hello YouTube, this video will discuss multiple linear regression, but first, what is the difference between multiple linear regression and simple linear regression? Well, in simple linear regression, we are trying to predict y, and we have one predictor, and we're going to see if x is useful in predicting the value of y. In multiple linear regression, we have multiple predictors, so now we're going to try to use x1, x2, and x3 here to ultimately predict the value of y. So then when we finish our analysis, we should be able to say, well, x1 was useful, but x2 and x3 are not, or maybe none of them are useful, or maybe all of them are useful in predicting y. But a useful first step is to create a scatter plot matrix, and we'll do that now. To do this in SAS is just proc sg scatter. On the next line, it's going to be matrix, and then whatever variables you want to be included in the matrix. Well, I want all of them in there, so I'm just going to put y, x1, x2, x3, and then we'll go ahead and run. So we've created our scatter plot matrix. Let's take a look. And what we're looking for are linear relationships between y and then either x1, x2, or x3. So let's start with y and x1. So we're looking at these two scatter plots right here. So yes, it does look like there is a linear relationship between y and x1. So that's good. Let's look at x2 and y. So we would be looking at this scatter plot and then this scatter plot. It does not look like there's a linear relationship then between y and x2. So uh, if we were just going to go off of this scatter plot matrix, we might say that x1 will be useful in predicting y, but x2 will not. Then basing it off of x3, it does not look like there's a linear relationship between y and x3. And let's quickly talk about how to analyze individual scatter plots in here. So let's just analyze this guy. So what exactly is on the y-axis and what exactly is on the x-axis? Well, this one's easy to see. Whatever variable is in the column, that's what's on your x-axis. So x1's in the column here, so that means that that's what makes up our x-axis. And we can see this easily because we also have labels 1 through 7. Well, if we go back to our data and look at x1, x1 is this column, well, there you have it, 1 through 7. So for this scatter plot here, it has x1 on the x-axis, y on the y-axis. Now, when we go to this scatter plot, then it's reversed. So since y is in the column, that means y is on your x-axis, and then x1 is going to be on your y-axis. So we said, judging upon the results from our scatter plot matrix, x1 was the only one that showed a linear relationship with y. So now let's use some actual statistical tests here. And the first one that we're going to do is an overall f test. And this will determine if at least one of those variables is useful in predicting y. Now the code for this is just going to be proc reg, just like in simple linear regression. And we can specify our data here if we want. And then next line will be model, and then whatever variables we're modeling, here it will be y equals x1, x2, x3. And then let's go ahead and run. And when you run this, you're going to get a long list of results. But if you scroll up, you should find the ANOVA table that we use to analyze simple linear regression, and it should look very familiar. Before we start to analyze, let's go back and just talk about the model used to represent this scenario. So given that we have three x values here, we are going to use this model. So our model will be y hat, which is just our estimated regression line, equals beta zero. Remember that these represent subscripts. So anytime I have a zero right after a b, it's really beta sub zero. So beta sub zero, which is our intercept, plus beta sub one times x one. So our parameter for x one times whatever the x one value is, then plus our parameter for x two, and then so on. So now this is our model. What does that ANOVA table tell us? Well, the first thing that we can actually pull from this printout is we can come down and we can look at our parameter estimates. If you just wanted an estimated regression line and you definitely wanted to use all of those x values, then here it is. Well, it would just be y hat is equal to negative 0 0.06 plus 3.29 x1 plus 0.315 x2 minus 0.55 x3. So that would be your estimated regression line if you know you want to use all of the x values. And while we're here, we should talk about the r-square values. Now that we're in multiple linear regression, we want to focus on the adjusted r-square. Here it is 0 
which is very good, and that implies that 95% of y can be predicted from x1, x2, and x3. So that's a very good adjusted r square. So why do we want to focus on adjusted r square rather than just r square? Well, for each of these predictors, it comes at the cost of a degree of freedom. So x1, x2, and x3, not counting the intercept here. So we can look at this and we can see this in our model. So degrees of freedom, there are three for x1, x2, and x3. So let's say we were to add an x4 or a fourth predictor. Then our r square would probably go up, but that doesn't take into the account that we're adding another degree of freedom. That would adjust our model if we added x4 to degrees of freedom four, and then our adjusted r square would take that fourth degree of freedom freedom into account then. So if x4 really isn't a very good predictor, this could actually end up going down. All right, now we're ready to analyze the overall F test. So let's take a look at our null and alternate hypotheses. For the overall F test, the purpose is to determine if at least one of these variables is useful in predicting y. So if at least one x is useful in predicting the value of y. Our null hypothesis is that they are all utterly useless. So beta 1 is equal to beta 2 is equal to beta 3 is equal to 0, meaning all of those x values, none of them are useful in predicting y. Notice that I didn't include the intercept beta 0 here. We're just testing the parameters on the x values. Now our alternate hypothesis is that at least one of them is useful. So let's say we reject the null. Then we know at least one of them is useful in predicting y, but we don't necessarily know which one it is. And determining if we should reject the null is a very simple process. I'm going to assume that alpha is equal to 0.05 for all of these tests. So let's go to our results. Assuming alpha is 0.05 and we have a p-value of 0.005, which means our p-value is less than alpha, so we can go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. So for this guy then, the conclusion is that we're going to reject the null and conclude that the alternate hypothesis is correct, at least one of these, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, is not zero and is useful in predicting y. So now we know that at least one of those betas is useful. So let's go back to our results here now and talk about the individual t-tests. In the simple linear regression, we talked about the f-test, we talked about the t-test, and I said that they're the same for simple linear regression. And in simple linear regression only, they are the same. But in multiple linear regression now, the individual t-test tests whether this predictor is useful if everything else is included in the model. So let's just take x1 for example. The null hypothesis for this could be that beta 1 is equal to 0, meaning x1 is useless. The alternative hypothesis then is that it is not useless or that it is useful in predicting y. So if we look at our p-value, we see that p-value is very small, which is less than our alpha value of 0.05. So we would say that given everything else included in this model, x1 is still useful, or beta1 should be included in the model. And we could do the exact same test for x2 and x3. Uh, all we have to do then is just change our hypotheses. So for x2, our null hypothesis then would be that beta2 is equal to 0. And we could analyze our p-value and say, well, our p-value is larger than alpha, which means that we would fail to reject the null. And then we would conclude that given everything else remaining in the model, uh, beta 2 is equal to 0, or beta 2 is not useful. Uh, we could do the same thing for x3 then. x3 also has a p-value that is larger than alpha. So we, can, we would conclude that x3 or beta 3 is not useful in predicting y. So we've covered the overall F-test, which can tell us if they're all equal to zero or they're all useless. We've covered the individual T-test, which can tell us if an individual predictor is not useful. But now what happens if we just want to test two of them at the same time? So let's say we have a hunch that beta 2 and beta 3 are not useful in the model. How would we test that both beta 2 is equal to zero and beta 3 is equal to zero at the same time, rather than doing the individual T-test, which assumes that everything else is included? Well, for this we can do a partial f-test, which is very similar to the overall f-test, except now we're going to omit beta 1. So our null hypothesis here will be beta 2 is equal to beta 3 is equal to 0, and then our alternate hypothesis is going to be at least one of them is not 0. So now let's actually perform this test. This is going to be very similar to the overall f-test, so I'm just going to copy and paste that code. And we're going to keep the same model, except now we're going to say test one, 
and test, and now we can just put whatever we want to equal zero. So we want x2 is equal to zero, and comma x3 is equal to zero, and then we'll put a semicolon. So we're saying this is test one, and we want to test if these two predictors are going to be equal to zero. So now let's go ahead and run. And now this is going to give us a nice little printout here, not nearly as big as the overall F test. And the analysis of this is really very easy. So we have a p-value here, and this is 0.2758. So assuming that our alpha is still 0.05, then we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now remember, we said our null hypothesis then is that beta 2 and beta 3 are equal to 0. So we fail to reject this. We can assume that they're both going to equal 0. So then the ultimate model that we could actually end up using for this data is just omitting beta 2 and beta 3 since we assume that both of these are 0 and now we can just use this model as our estimated regression line. Now I just want to cover a few more things, the first being confidence intervals for all of these predictors. Now by default alpha is set to 0.05. If you want to change that we can go ahead and change it up here. Let's just set it at 0.1 and let's get a 90% confidence interval for all of these predictors. Now again, we're going to leave all the predictors in here, even though we just showed that beta 2 and beta 3 are useless, but we'll keep them in there for now. So let's say CLB, so forward slash CLB. This will give us the confidence intervals for our three predictors. And we'll go ahead and run. And scrolling up, now the only thing we've added here, we've just added the 90% confidence limits as we desired. And the last thing I want to cover is how to predict the value of y using these three predictors in SAS. So let's say that we know x1 will be 4, x2 will be 5, and x3 will be 6. And this isn't anywhere in our data set, so that's good. So now let's say using 4, 5, and 6, we want to predict the value of y. And furthermore, let's say that we want a 90% confidence interval for that prediction of y. How do we get that in SAS? Well, in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is we need to manipulate our data a bit. So now what I'm about to do here is we're going to add the values 4, 5, and 6 for x1, x2, and x3, and in the place for y, we're just going to put a decimal point. So we're going to add those values to this data set. But in order to do that, we're actually first going to create a whole second data set. Now, could I just add an extra observation in here and put 0.456? Yes, I certainly could, and that would be the much shorter way of doing it, but in case you're reading from a text file or from Excel and you don't have the luxury of doing that, uh, we're going to do it this way. So first we'll create a whole second data set, data demo 2, and now we'll specify our data here. So y is equal to a decimal point, then x1 is equal to 4, x2 is equal to 5, and x3 is equal to 6. And now let's just print this. So we can verify there should be one observation with those values. Okay, looks good. Observation one, y is equal to decimal point, four, five, six. So now that we have two data sets, demo and demo two, how do we go about combining them? Well, what I'm going to do is really just add demo two into demo. So then we'll still be using the original data set here. So in order to do this, I'm going to go back to data demo, and then I'm going to say set demo demo2. So it's not going to erase everything that's in demo, it's just going to take whatever's in demo2 and add it to the original demo data set. And then let's just print this out, and we'll go ahead and run. So now everything should be the same, except we should have the added observation 456 with decimal point for y. Everything looks good. So now that we have our data set up and ready to roll, let's get a confidence interval for y. Now specifically, let's get a 90% confidence interval for the prediction of y. So given the fact that x1 is equal to 4, x2 is equal to 5, and x3 is equal to 6, that's what I want, a 90% confidence interval for what y will end up being. So we used CLB before to get the confidence intervals for the betas. Now we're going to end up using CLI, and we'll just use the same model in here. And going to our results 
here's the decimal point we put in for y, which means the corresponding x values are 4, 5, and 6. Then here is our 90% confidence limit for the prediction of y. So we can say with 90% confidence when x when those x values are 4, 5, and 6, y will be between 6.84 and 15.91. Now we have our 90% confidence interval for a prediction. What if we want a 90% confidence interval for a mean? So we can get that as well in a very similar procedure. We're just going to go back to where we put CLI, and now we can add to it and just put CLM. We could replace CLI with CLM, but we'll just add to it for now. And now let's go ahead and run. And we'll scroll up and now we should still have the 90% confidence limit for a prediction, which we do. And now we have the 90% confidence limit for the mean as well. Now the mean should be easier to predict, so the interval should be smaller, and it is. We see that the 90% confidence limit for the mean is between 7.9 and 14.8. Okay, but that's all I want to cover in multiple linear regression. I hope this helped. One procedure that I did not go over is GLM procedure for general linear model, and you might find that very useful as well in your study of multiple linear regression. But thanks for watching.